You ever just have those moments when you're talking to someone about a sport you've been watching for over a decade and then they just drop a quick line casually about how two legends were supposed to fight and you just had no clue? Just me? No? <laughs> well, yeah, this happened to me the other day and yeah, I found a bunch of really great fights that I just didn't even know were booked. Not the ones you probably already know, like Fedor versus Brock or something. This is a whole nother level deeper than that, despite them being huge matchups. And also, everything on this list will actually be announced fights. Not just rumored stuff, but I'm talking like the stuff with promotional materials and everything that was already produced for it. Oh, here comes Alex. We love them. True Classic are back. Okay, today I'm head to toe, all right? I've got my hoodie on, my t-shirt, and these new jeans. Not only are they super comfortable and going to keep you warm, but they do also make pretty good Christmas gifts. No longer do you have to feel like you've got to struggle into those jeans this Christmas as well. These are made with premium materials. They're very flexible, very easy to fit, and they feel and look great. Observe. High kick. Oh, pretty terrible, wasn't it? Okay, but it gets even better, all right? This month of November, in honor of Black Friday, the entire month, True Classic are giving you 60% off. So if you thought at any point, maybe I'll check out the True Classic line, the tees, the shirts, the hoodies, whatever, 60% off, all of it now, site-wide. To get the 60%, all you gotta do is go to trueclassictees.com slash MMAOP. So that's everything on the website, whatever you decide to go with, it's all versatile and designed to fit comfortably with your lifestyle. That's the t-shirts, the jeans, the hoodies, all of it, 60% off. Look, we wanna help you look and feel your best, okay? True Classic are gonna make that happen for you this Christmas, okay? 60% off for the whole of November at trueclassictees.com slash MMAOP. So jump on the November sale, get some stuff for Christmas, wrap up warm, and shop at True Classic, because they're good. Oh, 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 oh. It's about, oh, as, yeah. it's about as far as I can go at this age, you know. Well, now that you're as comfortable, hopefully, as Alex is, I'm Jason from MMA On Point. A huge shout out to our Hall of Famers. They're our biggest channel supporters, and it really means a lot. Shout out to you guys. And here are 10 incredible fights that you forgot nearly happened. Number 10, not the hammer's belt. All right, so I think it's gonna be really fun to do this in chronological order. And man, with this first one, it feels like I'm dropping a bomb here because as much history as I've specifically covered on this channel myself firsthand, I never knew about this one. And so you know how Mark Coleman became the first UFC heavyweight champ, right? He subbed Dan Severn and then roid raged the fuck out. Well, he wasn't even supposed to be a part of this main event. The previous event, the incredibly redundantly named Ultimate Ultimate 1996, was supposed to feature Coleman in the tournament to determine who would challenge Dan Severn for the inaugural title. Turns out, Coleman got sick and couldn't make it to the event. Fun fact, Shamrock was also in that tournament, but he got injured. So it was the legend himself, Don Fry. I fought back when men were men, not pretty boy champions or pretty girl champions. Who would end up grabbing the RNC over Tank Abbott in the final. Meaning the fight we were supposed to see was in fact not Coleman versus Severn, but Don Fry versus Dan Severn. That's who was supposed to be the first champ, one of those two guys. This was officially announced in everything at the event too. And it will be Fry against Severn to unify the championship. But yeah, it turns out he actually got kind of fucked up by Tank Abbott on the feet in that fight and wasn't ready to come back only two months later. So it was Coleman that got the call and in that moment, history was forever changed. Fry also decided to go for the money in Japan, so he never actually got his UFC title shot after all of that. Number nine, redemption. If you look at this poster from UFC 217 and you look at it and you say, hmm, why is that called redemption? Redemption for who? Did they just think it sounded cool to throw on a poster? Well, they actually had a real reason for it and things just didn't work out. For this one, again, Mark Coleman was part of the equation, but this time it wasn't even his fault for pulling out. He was supposed to fight, wait for it, Randy Couture. Oh, wow. Yeah, the two did fight way later in 2010 when they were both out of their prime. Hey, all the guys are teasing me saying we should hold it at Caesars and call it the geezers at Caesars. <laughs> but at UFC 17, this was supposed to be a title challenge for Coleman and well, his shot at, quote, redemption coming off the shocking upset loss to Murray Smith and Couture being the man to dethrone Smith in the aftermath. 
The problem was Couture got the injury bug himself this time around and had to pull out, leaving Coleman with the biggest layup of his career on paper at least with Petey Williams, Petey. whose only real claim to fame was being a part of Shamrock's then still white hot lion's den, standing to my far left, Pete Williams, and besting the three and four Joe Charles in Super Brawl about two years prior. Unfortunately for Coleman though, it really didn't end well. Number eight, Pancrase versus the UFC. So just a heads up, we are about to break up the early heavyweight shakeups, but this one was perhaps my favorite potential matchup that sadly didn't make it to the opening bell. If you've missed out on the Boss Rutten story by now, the quick and dirty of it is that this man was the epitome of the Japanese MMA scene with a litany of insane KOs. After suffering a few noteworthy submission losses when he was still pretty much just a kickboxer early on, he decided to dedicate himself in training to the grappling arts to such a degree that he would not only never lose that way again, or ever for that matter, but immediately following his last loss to Ken Shamrock in March of 1995, he scored three heel hooks in a row and went on an 18 fight unbeaten streak in the span of just about three years before deciding to leave in hopes of conquering the UFC's best. And who was the champion in the UFC at that time? Well, none other than Randy Couture, who himself was still undefeated at that time and had just picked off one of Boss's Pancrase buddies and Murray Smith, like I mentioned earlier. Not to mention the win on the way up over a 19-year-old true phenom back then in Vitor Belfort, well, this just sent all of his hype through the stratosphere. The only problem was that while Boss had made plenty of cash in Japan and had conquered the East, he very much wanted to come to the US and start his life there. And mind you, this was deep into the Dark Ages, and in contrast, Couture had already earned all the adulation and credibility you could from inside the United States, but there just wasn't any money during that time. So he said, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and go to Japan where all the money is readily flowing and not to mention a lot of talent was going and pick up some massive paydays. By the way, I actually got a chance to ask Boss Rutten about this fight literally about five years ago when Tom and I were babies on our old podcast. And how close was that fight to actually going down? Mm. It was close. That was uh, that was pretty close. It was going to be in October too. I remember because in September I had a fight against a bankers. They wanted me for one more fight, but then somebody told me, Guy Metzger told me the day before, that they trained my opponent, who was a new guy to the sport, that they trained him for like two and a half years specifically to beat me. I knocked him out. Yeah, but you saw that I was angry and my emotions got the better of me. I'm completely lost all control. So you were supposed to fight Randy Couture after that. Did plans fall through because Randy then signs with Valley Tudo Japan? Randy's always been a very strong character, you know. If he like, like doesn't like something in the contract, he'll say it. If they don't change it, he's not it's not a bluff with Ken, uh, Ken, uh, Randy. He's gonna say, okay, then I'm not gonna fight. And, and uh, thankfully for me, because, you know, later on uh, we became great friends. What could have been, am I right? Number seven, the battle of the welterweights. There are a few names in the running these days for the second best welterweight of all time behind GSP. You know the names, Usman Woodley and, of course, Matt Hughes. Well, back in March of 2002, Hughes was a fresh-faced champion and had yet to even defend his title a single time by this point. And much like I've established, this was a time where the UFC was very much not at the top of the MMA world, and Japan in particular was giving it a run for its money in every division and had the best in a lot of those divisions. In just like I mentioned with Pain Christ, it wasn't just pride. Shudo back then had also featured a ton of top talent like Frank Shamrock, they featured Hicks and Gracie even at one point, and Sin Inoue who subbed Randy Couture when he finally did make it to Japan instead of that boss fight we talked about. And another big name was emerging at this point at 170 pounds for the Shudo ranks that you may not be expecting. Yeah, that's right. Early on in his career, Anderson was a welterweight, and at this point, he was 7-1 and one and had only lost once in his third fight. He was coming off of a monumental victory in 2001 over the previously then undefeated at a staggering 18-0 Hayato Sakurai. <laughs> 
マハのパンチ C1 も返すアッパも返すサトレーズに返すはい右ストレートフラットではないかさあねえねえップマウントピンチを切ったマッハが破れたマッハが破れたーマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れたマッハが破れた Pride swooped in with a better offer, and Anderson took the money and signed with them instead. So, Hayato Sakurai ended up getting the shot as his replacement. MMA history is just insane sometimes. Number six, judo versus wrestling. All right, so fast forward a couple years, Matt Hughes would indeed beat Sakurai and amass the longest win streak by that time, shockingly lose to BJ Penn in the middle of that run before he left for K1. Regained the title by beating GSP and was looking to make the second defense of his second title reign at UFC 56 in November of 2005. Who was his opponent? Well, pretty much the most intriguing matchup that he could have probably had at this point, aside from actually rematching BJ Penn. Which had yet to occur at this point. And the reason why is because Hughes, in this defense, would be up against another ground technician with a nightmare bottom game as someone who actually made it to the Olympic trials as a judoka and had a ton of accolades there, as well as winning BJJ national championships inside the US at a black belt level. I mean, we're talking pretty much the perfect style matchup for Hughes at that time. The name was Carl Parisian. Hopefully, you do recognize his name because we've talked about him. On the channel, but if you haven't, that's because he's criminally underrated from the early Zufa era. He was coming off a four fight win streak that included taking out Nick Diaz, Chris Lytle, and Matt s e r r a including a welterweight title win in the WEC before making his way back over. The only UFC loss he'd had to this point was against GSP. No shame at all there. But sadly, like a lot of other entries on this list, He too got the injury bug and in stepped Joe Riggs on short notice, who would, well, miss weight, so things got <laughs> a little extra fucked in that situation. Number five, the biggest fight possible. Two words. Fight, check. All right, so I don't think too many of you who have seen this clip don't remember this moment. If you ever saw it, you definitely remember it. Because I want to fuck. I want to fight with Chuck. <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty unfortunate confusing of the English language, but the meme has kind of overshadowed what was actually happening here. The UFC wasn't just getting these two in the cage for a nebulous, to be soon announced sort of maybe title fight. They were actually giving us a very specific date, location, and event number. At UFC 65 on November 18th, 2006. And they were saying it was already signed and agreed to by all parties. All Liddell had to do was win his fight against Sabral. Liddell won, so why didn't this happen? Well, thankfully, no injuries this time around. But the whole thing only took about a month to unravel. Why? Well, the UFC was eager to blame Pride for this in saying that they didn't want to properly do business, while Tito Ortiz was claiming that he was contractually obligated for a rematch with Liddell at UFC 66, which actually did go down, if you remember, in December of that same year. So, if you're keeping track here, by the way, the UFC was trying to get Liddell to fight two months back to back, November and December. I mean, can you imagine a UFC champ fighting two months back to back, especially in today's age? Anyhow, the situation. Was very clearly overbooked, and the UFC was evidently way too tied up to make this all work. Not to mention, Silva would get KO'd by Mirko Krokop in September. So, yeah, there was no way he was ever going to make it to that fight. RIP, fuck Chuck. Fuck Chuck! Number four, the baddest man on the planet. Imagine our current situation with the UFC title picture, and Gani left on top with the belt. 
not at all fumbling the bag and having an insane performance against Tyson Fury. Incredible stuff, right? Well, this near exact same scenario basically had all the makings to happen nearly 20 years ago. Well, with who? Randy Couture. But unfortunately for him, not anywhere near the same level of success because the UFC had not been pressed legally like they have been now with two major ongoing class action lawsuits. Ones that meant, I don't know, fair contracts? Meaning there was essentially no way out of UFC contract back then, not even an expiration date like what Ngani used to free himself. They could just indefinitely hold you forever. And instead of having a situation where Nganu was able to fight Fury, in this case, Couture wanted to fight the then consensus GOAT Fedor Emelianenko in Affliction, but that's actually not the matchup I'm talking about today. I don't think any of you have forgotten about Fedor versus Couture. But for UFC 81 on February 2nd, 2008, it was announced that the former Pride champion Antonio Rodrigo Nogueira and one of the most legendary fighters ever was offered and officially awarded a shot at Randy Couture's heavyweight UFC title. But because of all this ongoing drama, Randy Couture was doing his best to fight the UFC on a legal front to get the Fedor fight signed and he turned down the Big Nog fight in an effort to hold his ground. So then Big Nog would instead go on to win the interim title against Tim Sylvia and while the two would eventually fight about two years later, they were both pretty soundly out of their prime by then and the title picture. Still though, definitely go watch that fight. Phenomenal fight. Number three, who needs the UFC? All right, so to this point, mostly what we've talked about is pride versus the UFC or shooto versus the UFC pain Christ. But then there was one pretty big American organization that often gets forgotten about or basically only remembered for one instance with Petrizelli and Kimbo. Seth Petrizelli is fighting Kimbo Slice. This is a last minute replacement. I gotta think Seth, Seth Petrizelli is gonna fuck him up. Basically a fight that tanked the entire promotion after alleged fight fixing rumors. Well, well, as many of you know, the organization was called Elite XC, and while they turned out to be an absolute money pit before finally collapsing in 2008, well, hey, they actually had some pretty awesome fights, and none other than Nick Diaz was still in the show with nearly every card he was on. And while today he's way more known for his welterweight runs, back in 2008, he was still very much active as a lightweight. And another name you definitely would have heard more associated with his younger brother Nate Diaz a couple years back was already earning his reputation as the underground king, Eddie Alvarez. By this point, he'd only lost once at 15-1, and won, won two belts, and had made it to the 2008 lightweight Grand Prix final, but his arm got injured so he couldn't participate. So he was definitely a huge name on the scene by the time they tried to book this fight. And for Elite XC, a night of champions on November 8th of that year, they thought, who better than these two to face off for their lightweight championship? But unfortunately, between the Kimbo versus Petrizelli fiasco happening only about a month before this, and you know, all that debt I talked about, well, they had entirely folded in the span of 16 days and never even made it as an organization to November 2008. So that was the end of that. Number two, the battle of the nicknames. How many fighters in this sport pretty much have a nickname that just replaces their real name? A couple do come to mind for me, but not really much. And two of the only ones are Shogun and Rampage. I mean, when was the last time you heard somebody call Rampage Quentin? <laughs> anyway, creative way to start an entry, huh? Well, these two had already fought before and, um, yeah, it didn't go too well for Rampage. In terms of just not even having a single glimmer of hope in this fight, it was probably Rampage's worst loss ever. Shogun just didn't give him a chance to get started and pretty much beat the brakes off him for five minutes straight. Fast forward a couple of years though, and not only were both men in the UFC now, but both had been champs at light heavyweight and were very much still at the top of their game. Shogun was in fact in the midst of his reigning championship, and what really blows my mind is I never knew the initial plans for UFC 128 was not to have John Jones step in for his injured teammate Rashad Evans. No, instead it was actually Rampage that was given the title shot. So why didn't he take this incredibly anticipated rematch that everybody wanted to see while he was still in his prime? I mean, we never got to see this fight. It's been lost to time. Well, Rampage wasn't injured or anything like that. He simply just felt four weeks was way too short notice for a title challenge and admitted to being upwards of 250 pounds. So would have been really tough for a weight cut. Anyhow, I still can't believe I never knew about this fight until researching this topic. 
All right then, so number one, when the world stopped. So as I said at the beginning of this video, all of these fights have been chronologically ordered, but you haven't seen too much to this point that's been recent. Why? Well, partly because I think it's too recent to be forgotten, or the news cycle is just way too active to let you forget something like that. Oh my God, I forgot Jones vs. Stipe isn't happening. When's that, this week? No, it's never. So you might be asking yourself, how could this one be recent? Well, to give you a four digit number, I'm sure you'll be able to guess 2020, 2020. Yeah, there were a lot of fight cancellations that year for obvious reasons. And to go further, I'm talking about UFC 250 at the beginning of June that year, less than a mere month after the fights returned to nearly empty buildings. And one of the fighters was Triple C himself, Henry Cejudo, very much in the midst of his reign at Bantamweight. But what about the other guy? Well, Jose Aldo. He had just come down to 235 pounds and had his first fight in the division in December of 2019, and Dana was really happy to give him a title shot even though he technically lost against Marlon Moraes. A lot of people thought Aldo won, so sure, let's give him a title shot. But that's when the old pandy happened just after this matchup was announced in April of 2020, so this just completely ruined Aldo's ability to get granted a visa, and instead, Suhudo would face another legend in Dominic Cruz and suddenly announce his short-lived retirement from the sport. Meanwhile, Aldo did get a vacant shot at the Bantamweight title, but yeah, things didn't go that well against Piotr Jan. Ah oh man, guys, that was so much fun to research. I'm a sucker for history and finding huge matchups like this that were supposed to happen that I literally only know about maybe two of them before researching this topic was just way too much fun for me and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Although literally scrolling through pretty much every event article I could find was admittedly, uh, kind of tedious. So then I have to ask you guys, what do you guys think? What do you think should have been on here? What do you think I missed? And remember, I'm not talking about the obvious ones like Habib versus Tony or Fedor versus Brock. I don't think you could forget about those even if you tried. But if you do have suggestions for our list, go ahead and hit me up in our writers meetings every Tuesday where you can join in on these discussions and shape these lists. All you have to do is become a channel member. So shout out to our channel champs while I'm at it. Thank you guys so much for your support on this channel. Anyhow, that's it for me, guys. See you later. Peace.